is that really in the Bible? You live in a world where everyone has an opinion about the Bible. Of what values are your beliefs if they are not clearly found in the pages of your Bible? The question we must ask is, are your opinions and beliefs really found in the Bible? Well, hello, I'm David Freeman Whip. Is that really in the Bible? Little Bible IQ trivia right here. Quickly name the two most important holidays found in your Bible. The two most important Christian holidays that is found in the pages of your Bible. Christmas and Easter, right? No, no, that's not right. That is incorrect. Now, did you know that neither one of these days is actually mentioned in the Bible as far as the original language? Now, you would think that you would find, I mean, think about it, the two biggest celebration, the two biggest Christian celebrations, Christmas and Easter, and you don't find either one of those days mentioned in the original language. You don't find the word Christmas in the Bible. You don't find the word Easter in the Bible. You actually find the word Passover in the Bible. I just think that, that that is ironic that you don't find those days mentioned in the Bible. Now, you would you would think that Paul would say something like, you know, the apostle of grace. You would think he would say something like, uh, let us celebrate Christmas with gratitude and gift swapping. Nowhere in the Bible. You would think Paul would say something like, well, let us celebrate the risen Savior with an Easter sunrise service. Nowhere found in the pages of your Bible. Well, let's take a look at what is actually in your Bible, what your Bible actually says concerning the holy days, not, 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 listen, listen, not man-made traditions like Christmas and Easter, but what your Bible actually says about the holy days that are found in your Bible. Did you know there are seven annual holy days listed in the Old Testament? And, and we're going to look right now at the New Testament and see about these, what the Bible says about these days. Okay, let's take, take a look at 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 7. 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 7, Paul says, Purge out therefore the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, as you are unleavened. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. All right, let's continue on. Therefore, notice this, therefore let us keep the feast not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice or, and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Now my question is, why, why is this reference to the feast days, to the Passover, to the days of unleavened bread, Paul says, let us, us Christians, keep the feast. Well, what feast? Well, it's just mentioned here, the Passover, which is the introduction to the days of unleavened bread, the feast of unleavened bread. Now, my question is why? Why has your church not told you about the meaning behind these days? Why? Why haven't you heard about these days? They're in your Bible. You know that, don't you? They're in the pages of your Bible. Why has your church not told you about these days? Now, let's notice uh, Acts 20 and verse 16. Acts 20 and verse 16. It says, For Paul had determined to sail by Ephesus because he would not spend the time in Asia. For he hastened, if it were possible, for him to be at Jerusalem the day of Pentecost. Why? Why was Paul keeping the day of Pentecost? Why was Paul keeping the Passover, the days of unleavened bread, the feast of unleavened bread? And now here we see he's keeping the uh, Pentecost. My question is why? I mean, these are, all right, from the New Testament. We're reading about the Passover, the feast of unleavened bread, and Pentecost. And all of these are references to the holy days found in your Bible. Yes the holy days that are found in your Bible. Don't you think it's strange that your church has never told you the meaning behind these days? When right here we're reading about them in the New Testament. 
we're reading that Paul observed these days. Isn't that strange? Now, I tell you what is even beyond your, I mean, I, I don't have words for this. This is beyond strange right here. Every one of these holy days are about Jesus Christ. Every one of them points to our Savior, your Savior, Jesus Christ. Consider this, the Passover. The Passover is about, well, what is it about? Most people are sort of familiar with the Passover. It's about the blood of Jesus Christ. Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. When I see the blood, I will pass, I will pass over you. It's about the sacrifice of our Savior, Jesus Christ. That's what the Passover is all about. The Feast of Unleavened Bread is about putting Christ in, in order, in other words, Christ is represented by the unleavened bread, and we put Christ in in order that we put the leaven, which is sin, out of our lives. So what is the meaning? We put Christ in, we put sin out. We put Christ in, we put sin out. That's the meaning behind the, day, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Uh, Pentecost is about receiving the Spirit of Christ. The Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God is what Pentecost is all about. Uh, Feast of Trumpets is about the return of your Savior, Jesus Christ, to this earth. The Day of Atonement is about the atoning work of Jesus Christ. The Feast of Tabernacle is about Christ's kingdom being established on this earth for 1,000 years. And the last great day is about Christ's mercy for all those who have never, never knew him, never heard about Jesus in their lifetime. That's what the, that's what the last great day is all about. These holy days, what, what am I saying? I'm saying these holy days are all about Jesus Christ. And you would think when you go to church, what you would hear about are the holy days that are all about Jesus Christ. And my question is, why haven't you heard about these days in your local church? Listen to this offer and I'll be right back. What kind of holidays will be kept when Jesus Christ returns to set up his kingdom on this earth? Will the traditional holidays of our society be kept, or will God institute His holy days found in the pages of your Bible? Find the answer to this question by ordering your free magazine entitled, Seven Holy Days. The greatest story ever told is found hidden within God's holy days, like a mystery that goes deeper and deeper. So each holy day reveals a deeper understanding about the mysteries of God and what God is doing through mankind. Order by writing to Church of God Rocky Mount, 27 Brookledge Lane, Rocky Mount, Virginia, 24151. That's Church of God Rocky Mount, 27 Brookledge Lane, Rocky Mount, Virginia, 24151. Also, check us out on the web at isthatreallyinthebible.com. Okay, let's talk about the Passover here. The Passover sets the stage for the other annual holy days. It is the beginning of God's master plan of salvation. And remember, every one of these holy days point to Jesus Christ. Every one of these holy days is about Jesus Christ. Okay, the Passover is about a covenant, an agreement. That's what the word means, covenant. It is an agreement between two people, God and an individual. And you have God's part of the covenant, you know, His grace, His mercy, His, for His forgiveness of our sins. You have God's part, but then you have our part. You can't just make a covenant with yourself. You've got to have two people involved in that covenant. And so this covenant, the Passover, is about an agreement between God and and an individual, or God and you. That's what it's all about. Now, I was driving, in, driving down the road recently, and I was listening to some um, rock and roll music, I believe, and I can't think of the name of this song, but I just thought the words were interesting. Old song back in the 70s, I'd say. 
can't think of the, the name of it, but the word said something like this. It don't mean nothing, and of course you can use bad grammar when you sing a song. Okay, it don't mean nothing, these words that people say. No, it don't mean nothing, these games that people play. No, it don't mean nothing until you sign it on the dotted line. I sort of like that because when I talk, when I think about religion, you know, religion, you know, far as from God's perspective, it doesn't mean anything. These words that people say, oh, I love you, Jesus, I just love you so much. The words don't mean anything. These religious games of church going and singing in the choir and all of that, the games, they don't mean anything either to God. And it doesn't really mean anything until you sign it on the dotted line. What are we talking about? We're talking about a covenant. We're talking about entering into a covenant with God. Again, a covenant, it takes two people. I mean, it takes two, excuse me, not two people, but it takes two, you and God. That's what it takes to enter into a covenant. Okay, now what is this covenant about, though? Well, let me tell you what it's about. It's about all that the Lord has said we will do. Originally, that's what the covenant was all about. All that God has said we will do. You know, too many people, religious people, focus on God's part. You know, God, I need your grace. God, I need you to forgive me. God, I need you to come through for me. I need you to do this for me and that. And bless me here and bless me there. And Lord, 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 Lord. And we're just full of requests. And what we forget is that covenant, we forget our part. Well, what is our part? Well, hold on to your seats. You're going to despise this word. Your part is obedience. Yeah, obedience. You don't believe me? Let's look at Hebrews 5 and verse 9. H Hebrews 5 and verse 9. You're, it's doubtful you're ever going to hear this scripture quoted in your local church, but let's go with it. Hebrews 5 and verse 9. And being made perfect, speaking of Christ here, and being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. That's right. Your Savior has become the author and finisher of salvation unto all them, uh, wait a minute, unto all that, what, what was it? I can't hear you. Unto all them that obey him. Yeah, obedience. All these blessings shall come upon you if, if, Biggest two-letter letter word in the English language. All of these blessings will come upon you if you hearken unto the voice of the Lord your God. It's not enough to just give God your lip service. It's not enough to go to church. All these blessings will come upon you if you obey your Lord and Savior. And if you will not hearken unto the voice of the Lord your God, Guess what? All of these curses are going to come upon you. Cursed shall you be in the city. Are we? Yes, we're cursed in the city. Cursed shall you be in the field. Cursed will you be when you come in and when you go out. You know, what's wrong with, when you ask the question, well, what's wrong with the direction that America is going right now? The, the, the answer is we have not held up our part of the covenant our part of the agreement. We have abandoned our part. Well, what is our part? It is obeying God. That's our part. We have not kept our responsibility to be willing to submit to the law of God, to do what He says. And really, I mean, that's our problem with America. That's why we're going down the drain. It's because we're not willing to obey God. Exodus 12 and verse 13. And the blood shall be to you, speaking of the Passover, for a token upon the houses where ye are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. You know, the benefits of this covenant is a great thing. I mean, one of the benefits of this covenant is that you are a child of God. God treats you as his children. You are sons of God. You are daughters of God. And he treats you like a child, and he protects you and keeps you safe. As a parent, what would you do to keep your children safe? Would you do anything in your power? 
It was a hard lesson I had to learn when my daughter went off to college, you know, because as a father, I could physically, you know, I could protect her and keep her safe when she lived at home. Well, when she moved away to college, you know, that was tough because I, and I, I came to a point where I said, God, it's now out of my control. I can't take care of her physically as a father anymore. And I'm turning her over to your care, your care to protect her and to keep her safe. So the benefit of this covenant is, you know, God comes along and he says, look, when I see the blood, when I see the blood on that person's heart, on the doorpost of that person's door, I'm not going to allow the destroyer to come in and harm you. Well, what destroyer? Well, there are many destroyers today riding around through the town of, you know, wherever you live. You know, a madman, an insane man, a murderer, a rapist, a killer, you know. And symb symbolically, if you have entered into that covenant, you know, the blood is on the doorpost of your door, God doesn't allow the plague to come to you. God doesn't allow these things to occur. To, he will protect you. He will keep you safe. There's incredible benefits of entering into this covenant with God. And as we near the end time, as things get, you know, things are not that bad right now. I mean, you've got a job, your belly's full, and you, you know, you think you're happy and all that stuff. You know, but we haven't really entered into the hard times called the Great Tribulation. It's going to get scary when that time occurs. And you're really going to realize the importance of having entered into this agreement, this covenant with God, when that time comes. Bottom line is, if you have entered that covenant, you have been bought and paid for. You have been purchased by God. You are not your own. In a way, you're like a slave. You've been bought and paid for. God owns you. You know, have you ever been in the military? Some of you have. You know, the military, they will tell you what part of your anatomy they own. They'll tell you that we own your, and I can't say it on this program, but, you know, it, you know God's the same way. He owns you. Every part, wingtip to wingtip, head to toe, you know. He owns you. He owns you. 1 Peter 1 and verse 18. 1 <clears throat> Peter 1 and verse 18 says this, For as much as you know that you are not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation, received by tradition from your fathers. Now, in other words, you haven't been bought with, with money, gold and silver, but by the blood of God, the blood of Jesus Christ. And, and it, this wording here says it talks about your vain conversation. The word conversation means behavior. Your vain behavior that you receive from the tr tradition of your fathers. You know, a lot of your problems that you struggle with were simply handed down. They're generational, you know, they were handed down. You know, if your father was a womanizer, chances are you probably turned out the same way. These sins and things that we struggle with that are destroying our lives, a lot of that stuff, I hate to admit it, but we sort of inherited it, that. We got it from our parents. But, uh, you know, you're going to be delivered from that is, is what the promise is. Now, notice the next verse, verse 19. This is how you have been redeemed, but with the precious blood. In other words, you haven't been redeemed with money, gold, and silver, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish, without spot. In other words, someone had to die for you. And it's not just anyone. It's God who came down and died in your place. First Peter 1 and verse 20. Take a look at that. Who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. That scripture tells us an incredible, a little bit of insight, that this decision was made that God would die for you before the foundations of the world was even created. And I like to think of maybe how the conversation went. You know, that before the creating of the earth, you know, God, two members of the family, God, the Father and the Son, you know, they said, let us create man in our own image. God obviously wasn't talking to himself. Two members of the family of God, Christ the Father and the Son. And they're discussing, you know, we're going to create mankind and they're going to sin. And one of us are going to have to die, go down to earth in the flesh, become flesh and blood, and we're going to have to, one of us is going to have to go down there and die for their sins. 
This was all decided before the foundations of the earth or the world was created, this decision. Now, I don't know about you, but I, I just think it's a good thing that I'm not God. You better be, better be glad that I'm not God because if I was having that conversation with the Father, you know, and he said, now one of us is going to have to go down and die for their sins because they, they are going to sin. They are going to rebel. They are going to be stubborn and stiff-necked. And one of us is going to have to die for their sins. I would say, let their butts die. Just let them live out their three score and ten or four score years, 70 or 80 years, and then that's it. You know, you just get old, you die, and that's it. Nothing else to look for, forward to. That's what I would have said if I were God. But, you know, I have sometimes a hard time understanding the goodness, the grace, the, you know, that God has for we human beings. Because, you know, I'm not a people person. And I don't quite understand the love that God has for people. Mm. Okay. So the Passover is all about the beginning of God's master plan of salvation. It really is. And, you know, most religious people stop with the Passover. Now, this is so ironic that they would stop with the Passover. The Passover is just the introduction. It's just the beginning to the seven annual holy days. In other words, when you start with the Passover, you've only just begun. I mean, it's, you know, that was a, that was a song by the Carpenters. We've only just begun. And I think it was about a wedding, which similarities there, you know, the, the, this covenant, entering to the covenant is like a marriage between you and God. It's an agreement, you know. You're going to be faithful to God. You're going to do what He says. You're going to be uh, obedient to God, right? It's like a marriage, okay? Okay, so a relationship with God begins with the Passover. It begins for actually what Christ has done for you what God has done for you. He has made the way possible for you to return into the good graces of a Savior, God, to have a relationship with Him. If it were not for the Passover, Christ's sacrifice for you, there would be no way to have a relationship with God. And that's why the Passover kicks off. You know, it is the beginning stage of the seven annual holy days. It starts with the Passover, and the Passover introduces the other seven, seven annual holy days. Now, the first holy day that we're going to go into is called the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And really what it reveals is our part in God's master plan. In other words, after God has done all of this to make reconciliation, to make a way back for us, for sinful man, to come back into a relationship with God after He sent His Son, Christ Jesus, to die for our sins. All right, He's done all of this for us. All right, then what is our part? What does God expect from us? It's sort of like a marriage. You get married, you know, and what do you expect from your mate? Do you expect your mate to commit adultery? Do you expect your mate to cheat on you? Do you expect your mate to beat you up or to abuse you? And it, no. You know, we're dealing with expectations here. And so the Feast of Unleavened Bread is about putting Christ in and putting sin out. I'm asking, okay, what is our part in this covenant? Well, it is to deal with this issue of sin. In other words, once you've been forgiven by God's grace, what does he expect? What does God expect us to do from that point forward? Live in sin? I don't think so. Notice what Romans, what Paul says in the book of Romans. He will say this. He, sa he says, "Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound?" You know, people, religious people, that stop with the pass you know, Passover. Well, I've been forgiven. I've got the grace of Jesus Christ. Isn't it great to know the Lord? He's forgiven me. I'm saved. Well, the question is, do we continue in sin that grace may abound? Well, let's notice what Paul said here. Shall we? Are we going to continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. And you know, this is what this next step, the Days of Unleavened Bread, is all about. It's about our part. What does God, God expects us 
Yeah, to pull up our pants and accept responsibility for our actions, for what we think about, the way we live our lives. And, and more importantly, you know, there's another step here that comes with the, with, the, with the next holy day, which is Pentecost. How do you have the power to put sin out of your life? How do you have the desire? You know, sometimes the problem is you don't have the desire to overcome this thing. You know, you've been addicted to this sin for so long. It's a behavior pattern that is set up in your life, maybe 30, 40 years. And what you're, you know it's wrong. You know it's evil. You know it's ugly in God's sight. And you want to do something about it. But what you struggle with, you don't even have the desire to quit it. And you sure don't have the power. Well, the next holy day after that is Pentecost, which is about receiving the Spirit of Christ, which is the Holy Spirit, which is the power of God. So all of this is being set up in place. You have the Passover, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. You have next holy day that we're going to talk about uh, on the next program is the Days of Unleavened Bread. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid there is a way out of your sin. And then, of course, with, the, with Pentecost, we're going to deal with receiving the power to do just that. So, you know, all of these are about Jesus Christ. The Passover is about Jesus Christ. The Days of Unleavened Bread is about Jesus Christ, putting Christ in, putting sin out. Pentecost is about Jesus Christ, receiving the Spirit of Christ. And I'm telling you, if you've been in church for 40 years and you've never heard this stuff, shame on you. Shame on you. Someone, shame on your preacher at least. You know, you need to be educated about these wonderful holy days that are found, well, I'm not talking about traditions of men like Christmas. You know, Christmas is man's method for, cel for celebrating God. That just doesn't fly in the face of God. He doesn't give us the freedom to choose our own method for worshiping Him. He has seven holy days, which are seven appointments with God. Okay? If you had an appointment with your doctor, with your lawyer, you wouldn't call your doctor or lawyer up and say, I'm sorry, I'm not going to be there. No. These are seven appointments with God. And we started off with the Passover, and next time we're going to talk about the, day, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And we're going to go into each one of these holy days so that you can understand that, yes, every one of these holy days is about my Savior that I love and worship. And I think you're going to be blessed with this teaching. So, is that really in the Bible? You know, much of what you have learned, much of the traditions that you keep, it's not in the Bible. But there are days in the Bible called holy days that God, appointments with God that we're supposed to keep. And they are revelatory. They reveal truth about God's master plan of salvation that he has for all of mankind. Just how will Christ Jesus set his hand to save humanity? The holy days reveal that. What is the purpose of life? The holy days reveal. Why am I here? These answers come from the meaning and the understanding of God's annual holy days. And that's what's really in your Bible.